So, good evening. Um, I'm a bit nervous tonight. The reason being is there's a very close friend in the room. And when there's a close friend in the room, somehow you kind of feel like things have a different measure, a different way of being understood, a different feel, if you like. You're probably sitting there thinking, oh, I wonder if he's talking about me. Could I be the close friend? <laughs> Am I that special close friend he's referring to? Well, the close friend is actually myself. And I was curious about how we carry around the notion of the self. What is the self? How do we carry it around? And what does it do for us to have this idea of a self? How do we let the concept of self affect the way we live our lives? And one of the things I'll be talking about this evening is the fluidity, if you like, of self. The changing nature of who we are. And how accepting that will allow us to live in a in a more accepting way. That we don't need to be crushing ourselves, judging ourselves, pushing ourselves down because we don't meet certain exacting standards that we set ourselves. And yet we do. So one thing I'll be asking you to do tonight is ask yourself who yourself is. Who is yourself? And how does it help you to have that self? Now you might be wondering, what on earth is he talking about? And I was actually wondering that myself this morning. I had no idea what I was going to say to you guys. When I, when I came up with this working title, which is generally speaking what I do, I come up with a working title and I think, hell, I better do something with it. Um, I was sitting there this morning thinking, what, what actually is my message? What am I trying to say? What's, what is this all about? And what came up for me was that so often in coaching, and let me reiterate the fact that this is about the self in coaching, is that so often in coaching what we're actually working with is somebody's perception of who they are, not what they're doing. Not what they think, not what their beliefs are, or even what their values are, which is so often what we think is at the root of everything, but rather who they are. What is it, this essence, that makes them who they are? And how is that essence being met? How is it being manifested, if you like, in the world? But equally, how is that essence not being met? How is it being violated? by others and by the self. Indeed, one of the things I'll be arguing, if you like, tonight is that the self is the greatest violator of the self. And only when we start to look at how we think of ourselves can we start to free up the way we're being. Which brings me to another theme, which is this idea of being. A lot of the time in coaching we think of doing. We think about, what are you going to do to change your situation? What are you going to do and by when? And what might stop you? How can we preempt that? How committed are you to doing this thing? But what if doing is simply a reflection of being? What if being is actually at the centre of our doing? What if being is at the centre of our knowing? So I want to distinguish between the idea of ontology and epistemology. Now, I talked about this at the weekend when I was teaching existential coaching, and there's usually a, uh, a sense I'm making words up as I go, but I promise these <laughs> words exist. Uh, ontology is the study of being. Epistemology is the study of knowing. How do we know? And generally speaking, what we do is often a reflection of what we think we know. So when we think of epistemological coaching, what we're really looking at is what is the knowing structure up here that leads to behaviours out here? And we can think of that as kind of cognitive behavioural coaching. But I kind of lost a lot of faith in that, I must say. For me, coaching at its heart is about who somebody's being. Who is the self that we're working with? And funny enough, we talk often about this idea of person-centred coaching, and indeed, Animus itself is built, no question about it, on a person-centred framework. But I'm not so sure how realistic it is to think that person-centred ideas really exist. When I say person-centred ideas, I mean the idea that we create a pure space where somebody can self-actualise, away from the influence of others, where we don't influence or question their growth, but rather facilitate an open space for them to find themselves. But are we not a self too? Are we not the coach, a self, meeting a self in the client? And if so, what's happening in that space between two selves meeting? When you look at uh, the history of philosophy, one of the interesting things is how this self has been perceived. And 
it raises a number of questions. If we, I'm, going, I'm not going to go too heavily into the history of the idea of the self, but I do want to touch on it. If we look at the ideas brought, brought back by Plato, there's a sense in which, uh, anyone read Plato at all or know Plato's concepts? Some of you. There's a sense in which, or not even a sense, very explicitly, a world of forms. And in the world of forms exist these things which are the ideal of the thing we see down here. There is a concept of justice which exists in and of itself. Not a kind of justice we might, we might dole out here, but a justice in and of itself. There's a kind of love that exists up here, and we simply find a polluted version down here on this earth. But there's also a concept of the self, and that we are a polluted version of the self. There's a sense in which there's an essence of something. This is called essentialism. Now, those of you who know me will know that I'm an existentialist rather than essentialist, which means I believe we shape ourselves through our lives, through our living, through our doing, through our being, at all, at all moments. And indeed, what you were yesterday is not who you are today, and who you'll be tomorrow is not who you are today. And in that shifting sands of being is to be found the change that we as coaches try to bring around. But instead of working on the doing, the planning, the actions, we start to work on who is the self that's selfing. Interestingly enough, Aristotle, who came shortly after Plato, started talking about man as a social animal. The man defines himself as a, as a social being, and that the ultimate happiness, what he called epidemonia, is actually about realizing ourselves in a social context. And interestingly enough, you might say that neuroscience is beginning to prove that case that actually we are not alone in some, in some headspace that's uniquely ours, but rather that we shape ourselves through connection. And if that's the case, how, is we, how can we as coaches not influence the space that we're in? How can we provide an utterly neutral space where we have no impact? Is it possible? And if it's not possible, how do we bring ourselves to it in a way which enhances the coaching rather than pollutes or deteriorates the coaching. Those for me are the questions I, that start to come up for me when I think about the self. And there's no question that in my mind as a coach, I, I work now at the self level. But what does it mean? So let me excuse me while I have to get my little clicker and my water. And I'm just going to go through what we're covering this evening. So the first thing is what do I mean by self? But I really don't want to go too heavily in, in that question. The reason why is because I think there are many better qualified people to talk about the theory of self. In fact, one of the things I argue, by the way, is that when we're coaching, we don't need to know what's true. We need to know what's experienced. I couldn't care less, actually, what's happening in the brain. I care about what the person feels about what's happening in the brain. I don't care whether there's an essence of you or an existential version of you. I don't care. I care about how you're experiencing you. So I'm not going to give you answers to the self, A, because I don't have them, and B, it doesn't matter. Second, I'm going to talk about the act of selfing. And this is very much an active thing we, we do. We do it probably unconsciously most of the time, but this idea that we actually, actually self ourselves. Third, I want to talk about the narrative of self. And in particular, the stories that we create. And I, I've got to say, for me, the, the best gateways to coaching nowadays are the stories that people tell. And I remember as a, as a coach when I first started, I remember my first client, and she, she ran a dance school over in Bracknell, and she wanted to grow it. And after three sessions, I barely asked a question. She talked, and she talked, and she talked. And I remember thinking at the time, God, Nick, you're rubbish at this. How can you let this person just talk and talk? Where are your challenging questions? Mm -hmm. Where's your goal setting? Where's your, where's your uh, discovering the limiting beliefs? But actually, you know, the value is in letting the story come out, letting it reveal itself, because within that narrative that they've constructed is the meaning they're giving their self. Next, I'll talk about self and being, what it means to talk about being in the coaching context. Then I want to go through a number of dilemmas I particularly perceive as a coach around working with the self. Some of the kind of the, what you might call the perennial problems of humanity. Um, that we as coaches experience, and of course which have been experienced time immemorial by people. Then I want to talk about growing the self. This is where, where I guess you as coaches will say to me, Nick, it's all very well knowing this stuff, but what do I do with it? So I want to suggest some ways that we can think of for growing the self. 
Notice I don't say finding the self. In fact, when you think of um, Socrates, and he said, know thyself, was, it, was, was, that, was, that, the, uh, sorry, was that the oracle of Delphi? <coughs> I think it was the oracle of Delphi. It doesn't matter. All truth is fiction. But know thyself. Can we do that? I would suggest that we can't. We can only know roughly who we're being right now. And we can have a filtered version of who we were yesterday. And maybe an aspiration of who we might be tomorrow. But pretty much beyond that, it's hard to know yourself. In fact, I'd also argue that, in, like, as in quantum mechanics, we can't observe the thing itself without changing what we're observing. And so in the very act of getting to know thyself, we change thyself. And isn't that what coaching is all about? To bring to the fore the self that needs to change. And in that bring to the fore, allow it to shift. If we thought we were really going to bring it to the fore and know it's a kind of fossilized thing, we'd have to kind of wonder what our point is, wouldn't we? You have to wonder, like, why is knowing thyself as a fossil particularly useful? The last thing I want to do is just uh, look at the, the self lens in coaching. And I'd really like to stress this. But I, I think you guys know this about me. I don't teach models. I don't teach approaches. It's not my style. What I do like to share is the idea of a lens through which to look at the situation in front of you. And I was talking at the weekend uh, with the existential group about the idea that it's kind of like being an optician. You know when you try those glasses on, those really heavy, weird glasses, and they put a little bit of glass in front of you and they say, clearer or less clear? You say, clearer. And they put another bit and they say, clearer or less clear? You're a bit less clear. And they get to a point where you're really not sure which is clearer and less clear, and you feel like, am I a loser? How, how can I not know whether this is clearer or less clear? But that's kind of like what we're doing with this stuff. We can put the existential lens through coaching. We can put the gestalt lens through coaching. We can put the self lens through coaching. And each one we can ask, is this making it clearer? Well, that's clear. So, what is the self? Let me ask you a question. I want you to chat to your neighbour to discover the answer. Who is sitting in your seat tonight? Answer it any way you want, but have a chat with your neighbour and I'll just ask that, answer that question. Who is sitting in your seat tonight? <laughs> Let me just get some thoughts from you. Who, who would like to share who they think is sitting in their seat tonight? I just thought like a collection of thoughts and ideas that are one thing today and if I put, if I sat in the exact same place tomorrow, it would be a different collection of thoughts and ideas. Okay. How would you feel if they're completely different? How would I feel? Mm. Um, I wouldn't feel anything, I would just, that's how it is every day. Okay. Do you feel there's a continuity in your thought process? Well, yeah, well? I mean there's, there's a you know, a general trend. Okay. <laughs> you think so, anyway? Uh, yeah, well, I'm not, I probably won't wake up tomorrow and think I want to be an astronaut, but, yeah. you know, but... Um, well, maybe you did yeah. yesterday, you just don't maybe. remember. <laughs> just say the same general person, but maybe different. Yes. Anything could happen between now and tomorrow yeah. that might alter my view on things, so in that way I would be a different self. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Great, thank you. Yes. And um, I think for me it's the um, consciousness or awareness of my thoughts, my feelings, my joys or fears. Um, I think that consciousness, I, I don't, I think what I think is who I am, I think that consciousness is, is very important. Um, but also the space between your thoughts, as you mentioned earlier about creating that space, because um, your thoughts like passing, the mm. cloud passing mm. by. Actually, there's the space when you don't know what you think of when you actually connect to yourself. That's my that's my yeah, yeah, nice, thank you. Yes. I think um, I, uh, about five minutes ago, I was a frazzled, damned, little old woman, yeah, not <laughs> too happy, and now I'm uh, relaxed and um, eager and keen to hear what's going to be said and I feel calm and, and those things, you know, I've got to do each other really quickly but as soon mm -hmm. as I sat down, as soon as you started talking, then I became this attentive, interested, calm person. Mm. Are you the same person that you were when you were frazzled and wet? Yes, I think so. Yeah. <laughs>
So there are different qualities that make up the self. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, here we are. Well, I was just thinking just now, actually, that what you said about um, the self being really fluid. Mm -hmm. So there's the fluidity of it in the example that you just gave. Um, and I was thinking, but what's my actual baseline? Mm. And my baseline, I was just thinking right now, is, you know, some people's baseline, a client might come to you and say, my baseline is that I want to be happy all the time, mm. or I want to be achieving good things at work all the time, or whatever. Yeah. And I think my baseline is that I want to feel that I, whatever I've done today, I don't want to. I don't want it to be something that I, yeah. Whatever I've done, that I'm in control of. I don't want it to be something that I'm not okay with, because you don't know if you're going to wake up in the morning. Okay. So, Could you ever imagine a point where you would let that go and be okay with whatever happens? Um. Yeah, like I'm not. It's not a baseline of putting pressure on myself. But it's just, you know, whatever it is. It could be just like the nicest, easiest day. And I was out for a walk in the countryside on Sunday. And it's like, you know, you see little kids running around. There's, there's, it's been raining and there's slugs out and they're running around stomping on them. Yeah. That sort of thing. I'm like, yeah, I could do that if I wanted to, but I'm not going to because it feels a bit weird. <laughs> and, you know, so it's just a baseline of it could be the simplest thing. But, um, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? One of the things I noticed at the weekend, where we talked about in existentialism, there's this concept of disidentification, where you think about who you think you are, and then you ask yourself, would I still be me if I wasn't that? Or would I still be me if I wasn't that? What was really intriguing was, and you were, who was there at the weekend? Louise, you sat your way on us, and Sarah was how many people could easily be themselves without the negative qualities, but they wouldn't be themselves without the positive qualities. Mm -hmm. So if I wasn't unkind sometimes, I was definitely still with me. But if I wasn't kind, that wouldn't be me. And it's interesting how we hang on to what we perceive as the positive things that are the essence of ourselves. And the negative things, the things that hold us back, they're not our essence. <laughs> No, no, they're, 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 they're the polluted things that sort of enter sometimes. But no, the essence is the kind, ambitious, um, uh, thoughtful, interesting, curious, loving, whatever it might be. We, we hang on to the essences that seem pretty damn good. But then the ones that don't seem pretty damn good, we say, well, oh, that's not me, that's just the world getting in my way. So one of the things I'd love to think about this evening is, is how true is that? Is there an essence? Or are we simply what we are at any moment? And one of the things I'll be talking about later is the idea of shame and coaching with shame. And how, how much shame is simply a manifestation of the idea of an essence of goodness that we hold being violated by yourself. And it's interesting what you said actually about a different person today and tomorrow, but essentially having a continuity. If I move on from, we've talked about Plato and Aristotle, if I move on to um, uh, Descartes, Descartes, of course, said, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. And in so doing, started to isolate the self from everything around it. Now, he wasn't doing that in some egotistical way. He was simply asking himself a question of doubt. How do I know what I'm experiencing is true? How do I know that this room exists? These are kind of almost like teenage questions, aren't they? But they're very important questions. How do I know what's real? And how do I know what's not? Can I know what's not? So he asked himself these questions, and he realized one thing and one thing only could be deduced from the question, which is that somebody somewhere was asking it. Now, he didn't necessarily have to be a body, because he could doubt his sensations, but he knew that at some, thing, some level there was a mind asking a question, I think, therefore, or asking the question, who am I? And therefore answering it, I think, therefore I am. And in, in so doing, separated the self from everything else, but also assumed a continuity of the self. So along comes a, a Scottish philosopher called John Locke, who said, well, rather like you did, Catherine, in a sense, how do you know the thing that's thinking right now is the same thing that thought a moment ago? You only know that right now you're thinking. So this self, this idea self, started to go under, undergo, if you like, scrutiny and questions. And of course, it, it, in, in the 20th century, then started to be analyzed by the likes of Freud and Jung, who we'll be talking about in a second, and started to be looked at as a kind of a subject for exploration. 
And nowadays, of course, we've arrived at the point of neuroscience, where I like to look at the self as, a, uh, as an interaction, if you like, of chemicals and, and action within the brain. And there's a massive doubt around does the self even exist as such? Or is it simply a mechanism to enable us to evolve in a certain way? These are the kind of things that are being raised, but my question is, so what? You know, how does it matter to you as a coach working with somebody on what they're experiencing right here and now? So I want to move on to the next one, which is the act of selfing. And I think for us, we don't need to get caught up in what's true or false. We need to get caught up in how is somebody selfing? How is somebody forming their self? Jung came up with this concept of selfing, which is the idea that we, it's an active thing that we do is to define ourselves in the world, to shape ourselves. And that the act of selfing gives us, as coaches, as change makers, the material to find out how is somebody being? What is their process for selfing? What are their patterns that they reveal about the way they self? Does that make sense? Yeah. What, what is the, we talked about this at the weekend, what is the meaning of the way they're making meaning? What is the meaning of the way they're selfing? How are they shaping their identity? And we'll start to see this when we look at the violation of the self and the perfection of the self. What is their pattern for creating the self which is showing up in the room with a problem? Which is showing up in the room saying, I procrastinate and I don't know why. I'm a perfectionist and I haven't got a clue why. I want to live life passionately, but I don't know what that looks like. What is the self that makes that thing happen? Make sense? And this is where I think about the concept of being. And the question I ask people is, how are you being in this situation? Not who are you, because who are you implies some kind of essence, some kind of fixity, some kind of notion of that's who they are, that's who they were, that's who they will be. But rather, who are you being in this context? Who are you being in the moment? Who are you being with these other be beings? And how is that being affecting you? So, I'm going to ask you a question. Where in your life, and don't tell me this, but in your own head, just briefly, where in your life are you struggling in some way right now? It doesn't have to be a big struggle. Maybe you've got a choice to make and you're not making it. Or perhaps, maybe, maybe you are having a relational issue with somebody, friend, partner, family. Um, perhaps you're trying to achieve a goal and it's just not happening. Where, can you all think of somewhere in your life where you have some kind of minor struggle? Don't break down in tears tonight. I don't feel this. They, they sue me when they're snot on the carpet. So. But can you think of some area of your life where you're having a small struggle, a small issue? Yeah? Okay, so I'd like you to take a moment, just a minute in your own heads, and just write it down on paper or think it through. Who are you being? I don't know what your answer is going to be for this, but who are you being such that that problem, that challenge, exists? Not what are you doing, who are you being? Such that problem, that challenge, that issue exists. Take a minute just to think that through. Write down any notes you want to make and then I'm going to get to talk to each other. Okay, now moving on from that, as you think about who you're being, do you notice how you start to realise that there's an element of choice there? There's an element of, oh, at some level, this is something that's changeable. This isn't something that's set in stone. So the next question for me as a coach is, who would you like to be in that situation? Not what do you want to do, not what's stopping you, but who would you like to be in that situation? Who would you like to be in that context? And the third question, which I want you to talk through with your, your friend in the room, is what needs to shift in you in order to be this new person? What needs to shift? Is it sets of beliefs? Is it assumptions you're making? Is it values? <clears throat> is it where you are? How does this new being come to be? And just notice the feelings that get evoked in you as you start to think that through as well. Is, it, is, is there a feeling of fear, excitement, trepidation, hesitation? Maybe you don't want to be that person that wouldn't, you'd need to be to change the situation you're in. Notice the feelings.
Okay, and now just take a moment to chat to your colleague or your friend or your whoever in the room and just share some of your thoughts. What's come up for you? Who are you being? Who would you like to be? What's got a shift in it to enable you to be the other person? And how do you feel about that shift? What goes on for you? If I can ask you to hang on to those three questions as a, as a coach, they're really critical, but also as a human being. You know, I think too often we spend ages thinking about our plan or, or you know, what we might do to affect something rather than ask us, who are we being that's brought this situation? And likewise, who do we want to be? And understanding that implicit in that is some kind of choice. And then what shift needs to take place? Those are three critical questions for particularly any kind of ontological coaching, being-based coaching. Who are you being? Who would you like to be? What shift's got to take place? Very simple questions, but incredibly powerful at creating a, a, a transformation. Um, but likewise for yourself, hang on to them. They're really great questions. So guys, let me just get some feedback. What's, what's going on in your heads here, or in your hearts, depending on where you feel your stuff? I don't need detail, by the way, just a feeling of, of what came up for you in terms of the shifts and so on that starts to create. Yeah. So that the idea of the awareness of what you're not being, so by bringing that into awareness that allows you then to consider the choices that sit around that. Right. Perfect. So this is the, the concept I talk about, about you're in a cave, and instead of trying to rush hell to skeleton through the cave to the light, shine a torch around a cave. You'll learn a lot more, the client will learn a lot more by shining their torch where they are rather than just running through and, and not learning about themselves. In fact, there's a, a lovely um, thing called the paradox of change. I talked about this at the weekend too by a guy called uh, Arnold Beisner. And he said that, that change happens best when you're in the place that you already are, not when you, where you're in the place you want to be. In other words, the more you inhabit where you really are, the more you understand what's going on, the more change can take place. Whereas if you have some projected idea of the future, but don't really understand where you are, like, what's, what's holding you back in the first place? Who are you being right now? What are you feeling right now? If all you do is project forward in a sort of a, a positive psych psychological kind of way, the change can be a little bit superficial sometimes. So I'd say to you, you know, ground your clients in the present. Don't always rush into some sort of future space. Anyone else? So that's Rob, thank you Rob. Um, I'm just saying that embracing the fear and anxiety as part of being, nice. rather than just looking for happiness, but that is actually part of, you know, who you're going to be, mm. and accepting it. And is happiness your ultimate state? Mm. Sure. Well, I don't know what I'm trying to. Have you ever suffered a loss in your life? Yes. If I could have given you a pill that would have made you happy throughout that loss, would you have taken it? No. Why not? I didn't think I needed it. Were you unhappy when you had the loss? I was. I accepted it that um, it was part of life, and I just have to accept it that it was. And um, I was grateful for a lot of good things mm. that I had with that person mm. when she gone. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I noticed is, is there is a. a now, thank you for sharing it, by the way. But there, there is a sort of a, a cliche, is that too strong a word? That somehow happiness is the greatest value. I'm not, I'm not convinced it is. You know, I, I think when we suffer loss, a lot of the time, we, we, we become unhappy. When we, when, we, when we challenge ourselves to do crazy stuff, sometimes there are moments where happiness isn't the, the dominant feeling, and nor do you expect that to be the end result either. There's something else at the root of that stuff for us as living beings. I don't know what it is, perhaps it's meaning. Perhaps it's just simply the way we shape ourselves. I don't have an answer. All I do know is I'm not convinced happiness is what we aim for all the time. Otherwise we could all just sit in front of, in my case, Dexter, <laughs> 24 hours a day, you know, not, not trying to stay healthy. Just, you know, do you know what I mean? It's like I'm not convinced that, that happiness is the end result. I think there's so something deeper. What happiness is to you though? So sure. if happiness to you is just laughing at something on television, then that's happening. But actually happiness is something in your soul isn't it or something in your one of us that is but something that you've uh, it's almost like a con I don't know, contentment or a peace i think it's peace really mm. That's, and yet we do so much which isn't about trying to be peaceful that shapes our life in a more meaningful way than just peace i don't have an answer and by the way i'm only throwing that out as a thought 
that, that we should question stuff. And that maybe happiness isn't the ultimate. And wouldn't we know what happiness is if we didn't have the other side of it, other side, the opposite side of happiness, unhappiness, to appreciate happiness? So they don't all go together. All right, let me ask you a similar question as I asked you a minute ago. If I could give you a pill now <laughs> that meant you'd be happy for the rest of your life, doesn't no. matter what happened to you, yeah. doesn't matter what happens to you, <laughs> give it to you. No. Would you take it? No. It's your ultimate aim, isn't it? Happens. No, no. I, I think it's important to feel some pain sometimes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm telling you, this pill would yeah. give you happiness. You'd know it. No. <laughs> that, that would not be real life to me. You have to feel. Right. It's something deeper than happiness, yeah. isn't it? I think we feel it. It's hard to put your finger on it, but we feel it, Alison. Um, I did a bit of, quite a bit of research into happiness because I wanted to write a show about it. And ultimately, um, we, we can never quite capture happiness. Mm. Happiness is always pointing, mm. this, this was the sort of consensus of lots of theoreticians on it, that you are happiest when you are not con conscious, self-conscious right. about being happy. You are happy when you are absorbed in a, in a right. meaningful activity and then afterwards you say to yourself, I just felt happy. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was, that's the nearest Apparently. Yeah, the idea of being meaning flow. came into that again. Yeah. But meaning came into that again. Mm. When you absorbed into a meaningful. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's very rare that the, the, the thing we get absorbed in is something trivial and <laughs> you know superficial. We tend to get absorbed in stuff that we create meaning around. Now that's the work of Mahela Chits and Mahaley, Flow, I think you're talking about. And um, yeah, and it's a great book to read and I think it's, it's very valid, but it's about meaningful experience rather than just happy experience. Let me just move on. Um, I want to talk very briefly about the narrative of self. And what you guys have just done is experience the possibility, if you like, of, of the selfing process, i.e. that you can be responsible for the way you construct yourself in some way. And by the way, I don't subscribe to this idea that it's a simple thing, that we can simply press a button and be happy, or we can simply press a button and be confident, um, that we can do things which uh, drop off a hat. For me, it's a much more emergent style of change. The work I do is, as a coach is now emergent rather than deterministic. I don't assume that if I do X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C is going to ensue. I think if we explore A, B, and C, maybe D, E, and F might emerge out of it. But who knows? Maybe X, Y, and Z will. We just don't know. But it's an emergent process. So I don't subscribe to this idea that the selfing process is a mechanistic one. However, I do think what we can do is start to reveal the selfing process through the narrative that the client tells us, the story. The story gives us meaning. And for those who are interested in the concept of narrative, it's a very um, fast growing field of coaching, the idea of narrative coaching, which is to use the story as the material. So how are we constructing a narrative both together as two selves together, but how are you constructing a narrative in your life that is giving meaning either effectively or ineffectively or happily or sadly, whatever, to you? And you often hear people actually say, my story is this, or, or this is what happened to me, or it all came about because. As though there's some sense of, of, of obviousness to the result. But actually, is there? So actually, when we start to listen to the narrative, we can start to question, how are you shaping that narrative? How are you building it? Such that the experience you're having of life is the one it is. Make sense? And our job is not to point where they're wrong, because they're not wrong. It's just their version. Our job is to surface how they're making that story. In other words, the structure of the story, the mental, psychic structure of their narrative. What are the patterns? We see this in TA, by the way, in transactional analysis, we see this idea of the life script. The life script is simply a narrative. But this is my trajectory. But the great thing about trajectories is that if you give a kick in a different direction, the traje trajectory changes. You know, we all know Newton's laws of motion, and the fact is that trajectory is fixed unless another force is applied to it. So maybe coaching becomes a force to shift the trajectory of a given narrative. Maybe that's our role, is to surface the narratives and just allow it to shift. 